and the music rolls out. Did the old coal miner did a bug in the bow. Did the coal miner bug in. Hit the coal miner bug in. Hit the coal miner bug in. And the boogie boogie all night long. Um, I think this is one of those topics that folks are, they say to me, coal ash, what is coal ash? Uh, they're familiar with issues about climate change, about burning coal, about issues about uh, moving uh, our fleet of coal-fired power plants forward to other uh, mix of fuels and to other fuels. Uh, but people forget about the waste that is produced from the burning of coal. And uh, my background, uh, I'm a, a biologist by training. I worked on bird studies, actually in the Darce Bottoms. Um, did some things for the Department of Conservation, um, Nature Conservancy. Um, so I was working as a student across from uh, the Labadee Power Plant uh, when I was very young. And I had no idea that they were producing something called coal waste and how it was being handled at the power plant. So uh, I've learned quite a bit in the past five years that I think most even pretty educated folks don't know. So I hope tonight that I can share with you some basics and then we can open it up and discuss this more. I think we have several people in the audience that know a fair amount about different parts of this topic, uh, issues about how it impacts water, air, um, and birds and fish, and, um, and certainly people. So um, I'll begin and um, Hopefully at the end we'll have a lot to talk about. I hopefully won't use up a lot of time with the slides. And uh, so think about things that you want to discuss. And I'd be happy to share that and facil facilitate discussion at the end. Um, so this is a picture uh, on the first slide of a place called Little Blue. And I learned about Little Blue because I traveled to Washington, D.C. several times and met with other groups that live around coal waste sites. This, um, lake of coal waste uh, was created decades ago uh, near a power plant at a time when no one thought there was a risk of being when you're exposed to the constituents of coal waste. As you can see, people have homes right up to the edge of this lake. They were actually told that they could boat on the lake and enjoy it for recreation, and today we know that's not true. And actually, uh, there's a cluster of a very rare type of blood cancer um, around this supposed lake. So um, again, tonight I hope we can talk a little bit about sort of the evolution of the thought about exposure to these toxins and what it means and what we should be doing about it. So coal waste uh, goes by several different names, uh, and they're different depending on if you think it's a great thing or not. So um, my favorite is coal combustion byproducts. I went to a hearing on the river uses um, at Westport in St. Louis, probably around four years ago, where a lawyer for a utility talked about the importance of being able to move around their product. Um, we do recycle coal waste, uh, but only a portion of that can be recycled because of the heavy metals and the other disease-causing chemicals that are in coal waste. Uh, but we do recycle it, and it does actually reduce carbon emissions if we do that properly. So there's folks who like to think of it as a product that we can sell. Um, as a biologist, um, as an ant, as a person who worked in healthcare about 20 years, I think of it as coal combustion waste. It's what's left after the burning of coal, uh, and it contains arsenic, lead, um, and several other, uh, there's a list of about 22 different components in coal waste that we should worry about, mercury, things like that, that bioaccumulate in uh, biological systems. What is important to note is how much we make uh, most folks don't think about this, but it is one of the largest waste streams in the United States. Um, and I mentioned to someone earlier, driving up here, I see it in different locations. So we move it out into communities, and we store this waste often in communities because it is used as a recyclable, but often it's exposed to rain, um, to air and wind, um, and there's risks in doing that. But the reason why it is moved all over the place is because it's really hard to store it. So there's about 140 million tons produced annually. And the Labadee Power Plant, which if you don't know, is the largest power plant in the state. It's run by Ameren, Missouri. And they make over 500,000 tons annually. This is what coal waste looks like in its many different forms. Um, up here, this is actually a location in our little town 
This is a creek right behind it where you see the trees um, border that creek. This is just be being used as fill, and that's coal waste. This is city utilities earlier, um, actually was that last year or earlier this year? Uh, I think it was last year in the fall. Um, they had um, an emission that shouldn't, oh, so that shouldn't have happened. Um, and this is actually fly ash coming out of the stacks of that power plant. And that went on for about an hour, we think. It's hard to get the records on these things. I actually sunshined it. Um, and I actually drove down there to take samples of the waste. I was walking through people's yards and it was just like talcum powder in their yards. Um, so a significant release of fly ash here by air. This is an accident. This is in Kansas City. Um, and this is fly ash being transported uh, in a closed vehicle and then pumped down into an underground mine for mine stabilization. This is a road right here, a major road. And over here is the Missouri River. Uh, and this was sent to me <laughs> by email from someone who lives up here. And he said he stopped and he talked to the guy driving the truck and he said, what is that that you're putting underground? And the guy said, oh, it's fly waste, uh, fly ash waste, and it's coming from the local power plant. So this happens across the state. We have an example of this in eastern Missouri, uh, where they used it um, at the lime works. Um, they were m mining out material from underground, and then they were putting the coal waste back into it and trying to stabilize it. Again, another situation where someone um, has potentially damaged to their well from being close to that site. When you pump things underground, you better hope they don't move around and impact water resources. This is a, a standard landfill site where they move it around. And what I want you to note is this is powdery. Uh, fly ash is powdery, like talcum. And I've been down in the Labity Bottoms uh, when it's stacked up 35, 45 feet high, and there's a wind, and it goes airborne. You can see it in the air, and that moves wherever. Um, it's small particle matter. Uh, it can be breathed into your lungs, and that has implications for health and disease. This is a very simple schematic. Um, I think Clean Water Action made this uh, schematic here. I did not. Uh, but it lists uh, the potential routes for the toxins that are in fly ash and coal waste uh, to get into our water, drinking water. So this is a landfill, which we say is sort of state of the art. You'll hear that from the utilities to build landfills now instead of waste ponds, which this looks almost like lavity. Here's the power plant along the river using the water resources. Over here would be the ponds, and over here is where they want to put the landfill. And um, we do have farming that goes on in the floodplain, actually a lot of farming, and we have an irrigation well that draws out about 3,000 gallons per minute from the alluvial aquifer that all this is sitting in. And we grow corn, soybeans, sunflowers, lots of things in the floodplain as we do in most of these locations. Um, so this waste uh, can move out toward the river. Um, and depending on the hydrogeology of the location, there's a higher or lower risk of that happening. And then also, you see folks here with wells. And in the case of Labity, and hopefully in the case of many places, but not all, people are sunk into a lower aquifer, so they minimize the risk by tapping a lower aquifer but some people do not. And what I would argue is that this is a huge water resource, this river underneath the floodplain that communicates, oops, communicates with the, uh, the river out here that we don't want to just trash. So um, that is sort of a new way of thinking. So, and I think I mentioned this just in talking, but the things that are in coal waste the way that they're dangerous is not only what's in coal waste, so that say mercury or lead or arsenic, and arsenic being a huge uh, contributor to cancer rates uh, that we don't even truly appreciate. I met an individual who works on only arsenic who happened to be at a Senate hearing in DC when I was there, and he just goes crazy over this. He said the standards for exposure to arsenic are way too high in drinking water standards and that that needs to be lowered. Um, so, and we know from the sites that we've looked at in Missouri that arsenic shows up in the groundwater at those sites. 
and I'll tell you a little bit more about what we know about Labity in a moment. Um, but also, all these things mixing in um, a floodplain change the pH of the water there. And that impacts how mobile those chemicals are and what form they're in and how they then are incorporated into other living things, whether it be plants or animals, fish, or amphibians. This is an example for some work done by uh, Dennis Lemley um, out of Wake Forest. And selenium from coal waste has a huge impact on um, larval stages of different animals and on small fish. And um, here's an example of how it can impact the development of the spine in these fish. There's a place called Bellows Lake in North Carolina, and there's actually a lawsuit over the impacts of the coal waste on the fish that live in that lake. And it happens to be very close to a large population of people. Um, it happens to be a reservoir uh, that they've dumped into. And so these are important things, and they have actual impacts on um, bottom line dollars. So uh, Lemley and others have looked at the impacts to fishing industries and at some key sites across the United States, and it's billions of dollars. So when folks um, think about just one aspect of the impacts of dumping this waste in the water or near water, um, they're sometimes motivated by the impacts to fishing, uh, to natural resources of the state, and to the water resources, if not to the impact of, on health of the local population. Uh, I do have a article um, that I provided that I think will be on the website, so folks can pull that down and take a look at it. And there's a whole series of, um, of other articles that Lemley has based um, this document that he produced for Ironically, the Department of Management and Budget within the White House, when they were looking at the EPA coal ash rule, he put together something to actually put dollars of impacts from coal waste. And um, it's a pretty good document. It's about 100 pages long, but you can pick things out of it that are of interest to you. And then you can actually click on the articles and read those if you'd like. But this just shows um, the impacts of coal, coal waste and how it bioaccumulates in natural systems. I took this picture in the floodplain because I love birds. Um, I tend to notice them in environments. And I was shocked at the number of grackles that were around the new coal ash pond. And it appeared they were going into the coal ash pond and then moving out to the coal ash pond. And these, this is a tower that's right above the ash pond. So then I went and pulled some articles for a, another group that I work for, and we were putting together a symposium on the impacts of coal waste on um, conservation interests. And I realized there's all these articles related to the impacts of birds that use coal waste ponds um, for nesting purposes and, and as a result are impacting the development of eggshells, developing the impact of young. And so I just put a few of the different types of birds that there's some articles out there about. And again, another link that I provided on the website you can look those up. So if you're interested in swallows or in gulls uh, or in migratory birds, raptors, at Labity we have a family of peregrines that actually live on the power plant site. And so I worry about those birds. Those are the birds that I studied when I was younger. And, um, and we all know the impacts of heavy metals on the development of eggshells. And actually one of the birds is called coal. So I contacted uh, our local bird sanctuary because they had a camera on the nesting birds. And I said, can you please change the name of that bird? But they named the one bird coal. And why does this all matter? And why do people like myself get involved? And at a huge expense of time, resources, um, and emotion to work on these issues. And I would say this is the reason. Because that could be my family. So I currently live 3.2 miles from the current power plant in Ash Ponds. But my niece and nephew are staying at a hotel. They're up here with me um, for a couple days. They live less than a mile. And um, coal waste impacts the air they breathe and could potentially impact the water they drink eventually. And you can never take back the impacts on a developing child or a developing organism. 
Uh, so we know from studies, epidemiological studies, that if you live near one of these sites, you have a huge increase in the incidence of cancers. And they're typically GI cancers or respiratory cancers and then these rare blood cancers. Um, I can say personally, I know of at least five people that I've met in our close group of folks working on this issue that have a significant cancer. And one of them being a family member of mine. So um, this is why we do this hard work that may take 10, 15 years to actually come to fruition, meaning that we actually get a strong EPA rule that protects us, and then we get state tailored rules to make sure there are no loopholes and that we're fair with the utilities and the recyclers and certainly reduce the risks to folks like this. Um, bottom line is that we've always placed this material close to water, and I would argue that's the biggest problem. Uh, that's where you get the leaching of waste into water. Um, obviously, these are locations that flood. These are locations where groundwater fluctuates frequently. Uh, one of the issues that we're seeing with um, playing out the language in the EPA coal ash rule is that they talk about determining the natural water table based on static um, measurements. And maybe you can comment on this later. But floodplains are probably the least likely place where you can find static numbers. So you have, um, this is the flooding of 93 in Labadee. And this is uh, June of 2012. And this is groundwater. This is not surface water from rain. And this is the, the landfill site. The footprint of the landfill is about 800 um, acres. And we've whittled down the size of the landfill to now 166 acres because they're avoiding wetlands and other things. Um, but it's still on that site. As a biologist, I can go down there and see all wetland plants. Um, you can catalog the types of invertebrates that are there, the birds that use those sites. Um, those, are, those are former wetlands. And I think we have to find a way to balance the needs and the use of land but we shouldn't compromise um, our natural resources or people. Um, this is a, a wide angle shot of the power plant in Labadee from the opposite bluff. This is the new pond, not the old pond. And there's a lot of standing water in that pond and it's a turquoise blue, much like what you saw in the first slide of little blue. And that's the mobilization of metals. This is, uh, again, a wide angle zoom shot from across the bluffs. And this is how that fly ash that's like talcum is stored. And that's pretty common practice. I went down to CU Utilities. I could see it mounted up there. I've been down to New Madrid in the, uh, the Boot Hill floodplain. Um, and it's all managed the same way. What they move it around with large vehicles, um, and this stuff goes airborne. If you look at the folks working there, they typically do not wear any protective mask. It's probably pretty oppressive to do that, but they are around a friable material that contains heavy metals that is so friable that it can be breathed in. So how many of these do we have? You know, I, I hear, well, oh, that's only you know, a small number of sites, small number of impacted communities, but I think you'd be surprised. There's one pretty close to you. The average is there's one within 250 miles of anyone. Um, there is at least 1,161 ash ponds, and that was uh, cataloged by a couple organizations working with EPA data. But many of these sites are not identified. Uh, there are about 393 ash ponds at least, I'd say half, 40% is pretty conservative, do not have liners. And by liners, I mean that um, you can line it with a material like clay. Uh, I've actually seen sites in Missouri where they line it with fly ash. They literally take fly ash and they compress it and they call that a liner. So that's protecting your groundwater. And, um, and then they place in some sites, this is sort of state of the art, a plastic... Um, liner on that, which comes in large sheets. They call it welding it. Well, they heat it, and they meld it together. And that is about the thickness of a business card. 
So that's what tons and tons of fly ash, whether it be powdery, wet, or uh, semi-concrete like consistency is sitting on forever. Because when you build a landfill, you're not intending on ever moving it. And those locations are in floodplains, where there's a high groundwater and fluctuating groundwater levels. Really egregious, I think, personally, is putting it in mines. So taking an underground um, opening and filling it with fly ash. And then there's these untold structural fills, and I'll show you some pictures of those. But that literally means that a trucking company can go into a power plant, fill up the back of a truck with minimal cover, and then move it out to another location. And in the state of the Missouri, in the state of Missouri right now, they don't require tracking the amount or the place and if there's a liner involved. They used to. And we went down to Jeff City to meet with DNR, and I think it was 2000, 2001, they changed it, and we went and spoke to them in 2008 to reinstitute that requirement to at least track where this stuff is going. But we don't have any idea right now in the state of Missouri. So the, there's no way to know how many of those locations are across the nation and in states that allow that. Um, there was a report that came out called The State of Failure, which talked about um, the lack of regulations in states. And Missouri was one of the cited states. Um, and what they looked at was not only the lack of regulation, but the amount of ash being produced. As many of you know, Missouri's pretty dependent on coal right now. So 70-plus uh, percent of our energy needs supplied by coal, burning coal. So we make quite a bit for the size of our state and the number of people who live in it and the amount of energy we use. Um, so we have 32 ponds, and I think we're up to about four or five landfills at this point. They're not all completely built. Um, in the St. Louis area, we have one landfill um, and one set of scrubbers on that power plant that has the landfill, and that just went into operation. And at Labadee, Merrimack, and Rush Island, there's proposals to build landfills there. Damage cases. So folks will say, well, we don't hear anything about damages to water resources in the state of Missouri. Well, in the state of Missouri, we don't measure groundwater around these sites, so we don't know. So when you look at this map, you see all these, all these sites out east, and then you see Missouri with virtually nothing going on there. But that will change if we have groundwater monitoring in the state around the sites. At Labadee, we have around 20 uh, monitoring wells that are situated around the perimeter of the landfill site that has nothing on it yet, and there are hits on arsenic, lead, aluminum. Uh, arsenic is at six times the drinking water standard in those wells. And they aren't really, really well designed for picking up contamination, meaning they're pretty shallow, and some of these materials move down and through the floodplain. So we know something about Labity more than we do about other sites that don't have any monitoring. But I would argue we need that information for all those sites to protect the people who live around there. And again, in floodplains, we're growing a lot of food. So we're growing rice down in New Madrid, right near the New Madrid landfills and ponds. And in Labadee, we're growing a lot of crops there, just like any of these floodplains. So these two interests are competing for the use of land and water, but neither should be destroying the resources and um, increasing the risk to people who live there. So I think we can, get, we can get that to happen, but it'll take some doing. This is the rotary drilling site in Crystal City. This is an example of structural fill. This whole, it's a little dark, but this whole area right here is all coal ash and coal waste, mostly coal ash. And this is a lake below it that the Elks Lodge owns. They teach kids how to fish there. The Boy Scouts go there. Uh, it, it, it was a bad story when it hit. Uh, this location is actually uh, in remediation. EPA Region 7 had hearings, and they're trying to clean it up. There's mercury, arsenic, detected in the water here, um, dying fish. I think there was supposed to be one there somewhere. Can't see it, it's off, oh, there it is, right there. Uh, when we were there, there was actually fish trying to get out of the water, and I, I don't know what that was about, but I'm sure it was exposure to something. But this is what we do. This over on, 
other side of this location, there's a bank and some other things here, and they were building this up with this virtually free fill to build a, uh, another business on top of that. So there's this economic driver to use this stuff that's cheap and not a lot of oversight as to the impact to water and people. I told you about the drinking water standard for arsenic and labity. This is one of those monitoring wells right here as it sits in water. And again, this is probably June or July. Um, I have photographs that span the entire time we've been working on this issue. And there's several times a year for weeks that there's groundwater coming up through the floodplain. There probably is right now because we've had a significant amount of water. And the, as the river rises, the groundwater in the floodplain rises. So this is pretty typical. Again, Missouri does not require, by law, groundwater monitoring around coal ash ponds or landfills. We do, and that meaning all of them, and a standard for that. So of the few landfills that we have in Missouri, we do have monitoring plans around those landfills, but it's piecemeal. And what they say is because, oh, the, there's differences between those sites, but there should be minimum standards of what has to be measured, how many wells need to surround the site, in a system of reporting that information where the state takes more accountability for that. That's what many of us believe and that's what we're fighting to get. Pines, Indiana. Um, I went to the coal ash hearing that was in Chicago. I think they had five or six and people wanted more and they added a few sites. Um, and this was like 2010. And uh, I met a whole busload of folks from Pines, Indiana. And one of the ladies, um, we stayed in communication because we were brand new. We didn't know what we were doing. And these folks had been fighting this for a long time. In Pines, they actually made the whole town the landfill. So that idea of moving stuff out of the power plant and dumping it somewhere, that's what they did. And the landfill was actually sitting in the middle of the town. So anywhere in that town, you can find um, bottom ash used on the roads, in piles at the end of roads, kids playing in it. Uh, so there was a lot of exposure. Well, there's a lot of cancers in this town now, and they had to actually provide water for the entire town, which is not really large. I think there's, do I have it on here? Uh, it, there's not many families that live there. Maybe 50, 65 are still in the town. But they basically contaminated the local water resources for the town, and they're having to replace that. But many of these folks cannot get out of their houses because nobody wants their house. And so they're stuck in this town, exposed to what is still on the ground everywhere, um, and just trying to make it from day to day. So this is one of those sites that I would argue we're going to find a lot of these if we start monitoring that become super fun sites. And if you'd ask me what is the primary reason why I think the EPA coal ash rule is not moving forward faster, that's why, because it's going to be a huge expense to clean up this mess. This is a location, Coal Strip, Montana. Uh, again, where you know this thought of um, putting it in the ground doesn't have an impact. Well, this is an example of where it impacted locations pretty far away from the original site. And what happened is a lot of those folks out there farm sheep and cattle, and there were die-offs of cattle and sheep because they drank the water surface water that was a mile off site, but it was contaminated by um, the dumping of coal waste at the power plant. This is one of those individuals, um, a picture he shared with me a long time ago of uh, you know the die off of his animals. This is the TV disaster, uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority um, that operates much like um, some of the co-ops in this state. It's in Tennessee, pretty close to Nashville, where I went to school. And um, in 2008, right around Christmas, this happened. And it was one of these above ground um, diked ponds with wet slurry. And it gave way, and this is what happened. It entered the Emory River, uh, destroyed tons of homes, and um, 12 of them. Uh, but this is what it looked like. And it kind of reminds me of the 92 flood. Remember that house that they kept showing on a loop where it kind of went into the river? 
This is all ash. This is all ash from that impoundment everywhere. So when we talk about moving to landfills, that's a smart thing. Okay, so the ponds are a bad idea. That's what we did for decades and decades at all of our power plants. And now we know to move toward um, a better ash disposal method. But what I will tell you is even Labity and all the paperwork they've submitted to the EPA, they have no intention on closing those ponds. So when a utility says state of the art, we're gonna move this into landfills, they have no intention on closing those old, unlined, leaking, seeping structures that are posing a risk along rivers. And um, as many of you know, the Duke site in North Carolina, um, that it gave way underneath. Actually, the, the way they had constructed it, they had pipes underneath, and those gave way uh, at a closed power plant. But that old pond was sitting there. It was not remediated. It was not moved to a landfill somewhere. And, um, and that went into that river and damaged. Um, they found uh, coal waste lining the river like almost 19 miles downstream. And the reason why I remember that figure so clearly is 19 miles downstream from Labity is the intake for St. Louis County water. And I was told for years and years, you don't have to worry about that. That can't get all the way down there. Well, it did in the case of that pond failure in Tennessee, or in uh, North Carolina. This is another picture, just have added some of these because they're so dramatic. I mean, these were taken, everybody in the nation was down there filming when this happened the day after. This is the Dan River that I just mentioned in North Carolina that happened February 2nd, uh, I think that's Super Bowl Sunday this year. 82,000 tons into the waterway, and this is what that looked like. This is a, you know, when I'm, I hear people say, well, we can build landfills on top of old ash ponds safely. This is what happens. That ash holds water, and it never dewaters. This is an, this is all built up over decades of ash disposal and then a landfill on top. And these are tractor trailer trucks. And this is Lake Michigan. So this all collapsed and went down into the river or down into the lake. And that was in 2012. Now the EPA went out there, they did some studies, and they said no significant impact to Lake Michigan. Well, again, I'm a biologist. And I'm saying all this ended up in here. It had to have had some impact. Maybe we can't measure that yet, but I bet we will someday. This is my niece in her classroom, less than a half a mile from the site in Labadee. Again, that's why we fight for these things. That's why we're proactive and we try to get better regulations because literally uh, no one would be expected to invest huge amounts of money in something unless it was regulated. And so we're asking, as part of the EPA coal ash rule, all these things right here, monitoring, leachate collection, composite liners and covers. Um, the thing that they wrote up for our county, uh, at the end of 20 years, there was, well, there was no requirement daily to keep it wetted down so that it couldn't go airborne. And then there was minimal cover at the end of 20 years. So these are things that have to be thought through and actually put into regulations, into state regulations. And in our case, it was a local regulation because no one had a regulation. We don't have a federal regulation of coal waste, and we don't have a state regulation of coal waste. So there are two versions of the EPA rule being considered, one subtitle C, one subtitle D, of RICRA, subtitle C would make it a hazardous waste, and you probably heard a little bit about that if you were interested in coal waste management, um, because the utilities don't want that, the recyclers don't want that, they think it'll be difficult to recycle the waste if it's deemed hazardous, well, that doesn't bear out to be true, but um, I think in the end what we'll probably get is subtitle D, but I think we'll strengthen subtitle D, and that's happening right now, due to the things that have played out in North Carolina, in places like Labadee, the um, Paiute Indians out west, um, there's much more consideration for adding protections for these legacy sites and removing waste from floodplains. And I said that five years ago in DC to the director of EPA at the time, and, um, and no one was willing to say that. You know, they kept saying, politically, you can't get that. 
Um, let's just talk about how to line it, have leachate collection, and that's maybe the best we can get. And what I would say is that as people impacted by the risks of this waste, we need to say how it is and why it's important to clean it up and to do it right. And actually now, because of all the things that have played out, that's now happening. So in South Carolina, a power plant is being forced to remove ash from ponds, they're recycling some of it, but it's being moved to a landfill out of the floodplain for the first time ever. So now that's being discussed in Illinois. We're trying to get that in Labadee. Um, and that would make the disposal of the waste safe. Um, of course, we'd have to find locations that aren't on karst geology or have some other risk. So I used to always say, not on karst, far from water resources, not just our rivers and streams and floodplains. And I think we'll get there, but I think it'll take some time. And that's why we need people educated, engaged, and knowing what's happening in their neck of the woods to bring that up with their legislators and push to get some improvements. If you want to know more about this topic, oops, we, uh, we are all over the internet. We have, I think, three Facebook pages. Uh, Leo, uh, Save Our Bottoms, which was the original campaign slogan. There's still that Facebook page out there. And then we have Hold Polluters Accountable, which is one where folks talk about a lot of different issues. So what we've tried to do is talk about our issue amongst several other issues to get people engaged. So most people say, coal waste, why would I ever want to know more about that than what I'd hear in an hour at a talk and do something about it? And it's because it's connected to all the other issues um, impacting communities. And so um, that's been pretty helpful to us to overlap with several other groups. Um, we also have a, a website, um, leoenvironmental.org. Um, so come visit us there. We have a blog from the bottoms that we try to keep up. And we certainly want folks to be interacting with us. I now hear from people from Columbia, some people here from Kansas City, um, and of course people from other states who are working on this. So I think the way we get this better is more communication and discussion about it, and then bringing the experts in to try to find solutions to this problem. So I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Um, and discuss anything in more depth if you'd like to. I work inside all day long. When you come out, you hear that song. It's the coal miner boogie. 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 And you boogie boogie all night long.